Welcome to the life after. I'm Chuck Parson. I'm Frazier. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty hard. I'm Kelsey Grammer. That was a bad. <laughs> that sounded like a country singer. It did sound like. But he's got that low booming voice. He's got mm-hmm. that low booming voice. <clears throat> da, 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 scrabble legs. <laughs> Welcome to the life after. I'm Chuck Parson. And I'm Brady Hardy. <clears throat> Brady, um, hey Chuck, how are you, man? <laughs> I'm doing really good. It was kind of like a knock knock joke, but uh, the wrong person said knock knock. Who's there? Uh, I have a question for you. Actually, it's more of a demand. Okay. Um, can I you usually... do an impromptu? Um, I want you to do an impromptu. I, I came up with this no drive. Oh over here, man, this is rough. And I thought to myself, you know, I want to make Chuck do this something. This is going to be bad. Yeah, I want you to give me, and I know that we're going to talk about this. I have no idea. Just so you know, know, like sometimes we we pretend that we didn't talk about this, yeah, this beforehand, not, but this we not. but we actually have. I have no idea what's about to happen. I could switch this, and nobody would ever even know. Right? Yeah, it's all in your head. Um, no, you you know we're going to talk about this a lot this season, but I, I want to hit on it a little bit. Can you give me a two minute TED talk, impromptu TED talk, on everything you know about trauma? Trauma. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, I can do that. Um. So the interesting thing. Oh, welcome everybody. This is Ted, and uh, come to the stage is uh, Chuck Parson, uh, the co-host for the Life After. <laughs> He's going to give us a TED talk on trauma. I would have one of those TED talks that doesn't actually have an audience. You know, like this, like a late night C-SPAN rant by a by a governor or a uh, congressman. Anyway. Maria Bamford's uh, special, special, special. Yeah, where yeah. It's just her and your parents. Her and parents and yes, that room. would be my TED Talk. <laughs> Welcome to my TED Talk. Um, trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I am really interested in the topic of trauma because I honestly think it, it dictates probably more human behavior than most things. I think it like I think it informs history quite a bit. Um, I think it informs present events pretty well. Um, because when people are traumatized, they act, uh, irrationally. So what happens when you have a a traumatic experience is that you are, you're so terrified or, or, uh, you know, um, yeah, true traumatized obviously by what's happening to you in that moment. Right. Good word. So you're right. So your body, um, has this mechanism that's, that's like way older than modern humanity, um, this is like, so, so basically like your experiences, the experience of being traumatized bypasses your normal memory, which is stored in your hippocampus, which is why people can't remember trauma, trauma experiences. And it goes straight to your brainstem, which is where like all of your motor skills are, are like, you know, that's where all of that is controlled. Right? Where it isn't remembered is that kind of like, uh, this is an interactive Ted talk where sometimes people raise their hands. <laughs> I mean, it is pretty small. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so when you say it kind of, that we're not able to remember, is that kind of what we get like repressed memories? It's exactly why we get repressed <clears throat> memories. Yeah. 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 Um, so what like other if you're in, can you forget though, cause it's not just like, you know, it's not just like there's a repressed memory or, you remember all of it. What, what's kind of like the gray area then? What, what, oh, you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like it. You have to think about it as like a sort of an emergency uh, system, right? So mm-hmm. it's not perfect, right? So like parts of it get stored in your hippocampus because it's an experience, right? But like once your body gets so terrified, it sort of switches like where it's storing things. Uh, so that's, I guess that's why you get like some people remember like snippets of things on and off or, you know, or they'll remember the beginning or the end of it, but not anything that happened in the middle. Um, and that's just because it all gets stored in the, in the brainstem. So what happens is like, for example, and the, the, so the reason your body does that is because it wants to make sure that you never have that experience again, because it's so terrible. Um, and usually like this is, you have to think like this is your brainstem is your lizard brain. It's the oldest part of the brain in the human body. It's, it's, uh, it's like what animals run off of is like affected. Like animals have brainstem like brains that don't really process the intricacies of experiences. They just learn and then have like reflexes that they develop over time right Mm -hmm. so that's the part of your brain that's acting it's what's it's what keeps species alive in a in the fundamental sense you know so um what happens is your your body is basically saying i never want that to happen again so we're going to put something in place that like if anything that resembles that starts happening we're gonna kick in this emergency mechanism to make sure that you don't fall into that dangerous situation again which is why people get 
like strong fight or flight instincts or they, well, they get fight, 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 flight or freeze, right? So some people, when they're traumatized, they freeze. Some people freak out. Some people get, will get violent, you know, they'll like black out and run away. Um, I used to have a friend that was, was, I think probably traumatized by like a zombie movie or something when she was a kid. So she, if, a, if she saw zombies or somebody acted like a zombie, she would literally black out and run away. And that was like a brainstem trauma response to being scared by a zombie movie or whatever, you know? So what would that look like on a daily basis for like a normal person on the street? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it can literally look like that, right? Mm-hmm. Because lots of things can be traumatic experiences, but like, um, a more common thing might be, um, so, okay. So it can, it can look like, um, it can look like, uh, like, like people in our community, right. In our life after community, like an example might be you walk into a church or you walk into a building that resembles church or a scenario that resembles church or like a small group or like something that reminds you of, or like a, you know, a counseling appointment with your counselor might remind you of a meeting you had with your pastor or something. And all of that would like bring back traumatic symptoms from like, you might have a trauma response to like want to get out of there or you might freeze or you might, you know, just get an intense amount of adrenaline or anxiety for what seems like no reason because you're not in any actual danger. And that's kind of the thing about trauma is that like you, you are being told, like your brain is saying like, this resembles the situation where we were, we were in danger. So we're activating the fight or flight instinct. So heightened adrenaline, heightened, um, you know, heart rate, um, confusion maybe like the feel that like irrational fear the need to get out of the space things like that or or again like you might just freeze in place and not be able to talk not be able to move um or you might feel like you need to be on on the defensive like you literally need to physically defend yourself even if you were never like physically assaulted it's still it's this old system like this thousands and thousands of year old system that that keeps us alive right so um it's it is a it's as if you like your body will react the same way to emotional and psychological trauma as it would to physical trauma so if like you were mugged and beat up you know your body's still going to react the same way even if even if you weren't physically hurt if you have emotional or, or or psychological trauma Right. So that's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a pretty intense mechanism. Like, um, I was listening to, um, some show where one of the, one of the hosts was in a motorcycle accident at one point and he presumably fell off the back of the bike, but he doesn't really remember what happened. So, but he has, every time he tips his head back, like, like to look up at the ceiling or something, his body like reacts as if he's falling off of a motorcycle oh wow and he and he has like a a minor like trauma response like he starts freaking out if he if he tips backwards so Mm. um that's happened to me a few times like in um uh like office chairs where like you don't know how that's going to lean back and then you kind of overestimate it and it just you know (laughs) is that kind of the same thing Yeah, yeah i mean i'm sure he would flip out if he like started tipping backwards in a chair or something you know oh god that'd be horrible that's the same it's exactly the same as being in a motorcycle accident thank, thank you <laughs> i just needed to hear <laughs> just you validate that. your experience that's interesting um because you know it seems like some of the things that would cause trauma would be something that just like it's fast like fast like jumps out at you you know that sort of like sure. fight or flight thing but also we're talking about like a long period of time with church and realizing that there was negative things that came from that but I think kind of like understanding, oh, this place caused some of those things kind of is like an event too. So that kind mm-hmm. of like that your your subconscious picks up on that um, whenever you do go back to those places, it's like, what, what am I doing here? Like mm-hmm. that uneasiness because it's like, mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, you, you've been able to cautiously deem this place as dangerous or mm-hmm. harmful mm-hmm. Uh, and here you are in it and your, your body is going to be telling you, oh. Shit. absolutely yeah. yeah 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 so it's it's actually it's an interesting point you bring up because there are like we say listen to your body a lot on this show and mm-hmm. like for people that have ptsd that's 
like yes and no right right because right 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 you can't always trust your That's body a very good point yeah sometimes you're in a like a like the example i gave earlier of like you're in a counseling appointment but it reminds you of being in an appointment with your pastor right mm-hmm. like you're actually in a safe place if you have a good counselor um but your body's telling you that you're not in a safe place so you have to you have to push through that in the way that you that's it, which leads to a really good point, which is like, how do you deal with trauma and how do you heal it? Mm-hmm. And I think the best way that we have figured out so far is desensitization, which is um, like either verbally or or actively doing something that forces you to relive your trauma, which mm. is sucks. I think KY has um, gel for that now. <laughs> trauma gel? No, desensitization. Never mind. Desensitization. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, so um, if you need so if you're experiencing trauma prematurely, mm-hmm. you might <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, desensitization. So you either you slowly the idea is to easily and safely relive your experience <laughs> oh, yes. that caused the trauma um, in order to tell your body like okay, that was not that was a specific scenario. We're going to avoid that. You need to learn to be, for example, again, in a counselor's office without feeling extremely nervous. So we need to do that. Or your counselor might talk you through a process where you have to you have to explain what happened in a traumatic situation. And a lot of times that results in repressed memories coming back out. Um Either by, like, they can come back out either by, you know, you talking about the experience or they can come back out by you being in a situation where that reminds you of it and all of a sudden you're, like, debilitated by, you know, like, you walk into a room and it reminds you of a room where you were sexually assaulted and suddenly you're terrified, you know, mm-hmm. and all those memories start coming back. Like, that's that's really common with trauma victims. It's like they have no idea that they have a problem until they're brainstem is like oh we're in danger again here's all of the things you need to know about this dangerous situation even when it's not practical but the goal is still if you if you have an opportunity if you've experienced a a memory if you've experienced something that you think might be um might be traumatic and that hasn't happened to you the best way is to do it in a safe environment with a counselor um but if you if that has happened to you then you you have to you still have to go back and relive it and desensitize yourself which sucks and it it's really it's really painful and it's not easy and a lot of times trauma your symptoms get worse before they get better um that's really common it's really frustrating to actively decide to confront your trauma and then find out that the process of working through it is worse than it was before you decided to work through it mm. but still the end the end goal is to is to desensitize and to not be so sensitive to it and and and, and it, it ends up being better down the line but it takes time you know so it's like a big time a big way that i found to desensitize that is um to be able to own my story to talk about it to yep. um kind of like get that empowerment back and to kind of have meaning back to the situations that felt like they kind of lost meaning whenever I lost, left the faith. Mm-hmm. Um, today we have a special guest with us. Um, a friend Angie is coming. Uh, well, she's here. She's going to be on the show in a minute. Um, and she's going to talk about her story, which is, uh, Angie, would it be say full of trauma? Okay. Cause I, I don't want to like dis- be sound dismiss it. Yeah. So if you're looking for a way to desensitize yourself by listening to lots of trauma, you've come to the right show. Right. Type right up. We've got Angie. Uh, yeah. but you no, know, your story has a lot of shit. Uh, and, and that came from, uh, religious abuse and spiritual abuse. And I think that um, understanding our bodies, knowing that uh, when we talk about things like this, our bodies respond to it sometimes, but being upfront with that and being um, kind of proactive and fighting against it, I think is going to be beneficial. And uh, I can't wait to hear your story today. Um, speak of the devil, the tr- uh, trigger warning, I, big, oh. <laughs> big, big trigger warning for this episode there. We do deal with, um, we deal with sexual abuse. We deal with uh, lots of churchy things that could be triggering for people and uh yeah just since we're on the topic um trigger warnings are literally like that's because of trauma that's like why that's a phrase right because and we like make fun of it like well we don't make fun of it but you know certain, yeah, do we chuck certain people make fun of it um and they don't realize that it's it's a very like real scientific 
like necessity to keep people from flipping the fuck out Mm -hmm. Um, so been there done that uh when he said speaking to the devil i thought he was behind me uh, i mean you know like like sabrina where i like to think that the devil is behind us both of us (laughs) for most episodes Uh that's you we'll be right back with the devil right after this Welcome back to the life after this is Brady Harden and with me is Chuck Person. Person. <clears throat> Chuck Person. Hey, uh, what do you want us to call it? Call you today? Angie J. Angie J. We are here with Angie J. Angie J. Angie J. Where did you grow up? I grew up in middle America, a um, little suburb outside of St. Louis. Okay. Known as St. Peter's. <laughs> ew. Ew. St. Peter's. We get really uppity about St. Peter's. Mm. Makes sense. We don't really. I just like to, I like, <laughs> turf, plex, I like turf wars. <laughs> that recplex great for lock ins and sexual tension. Yeah, you I know, did I did lock in our church recplex. our church would drive all the way to St. Peter's and do at the yeah, the lock in. Oh my god, did every youth group go there? Like oh, in, probably at some point, yeah. I would think oh so. wow, that's creepy. We went there. It's the the dude the the idea of a lock in in like in the middle of purity culture, like what were, what were they, they thinking? thinking? <laughs> for real. <laughs> it's outrageous. Yeah, lock-ins. What the hell? That's mm. that was. Uh, I was so horny at those. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> I was. I was a teen. I was an adolescent. <clears throat> in a, and it was the middle of the night, and there were all these nooks and crannies to hide in, and all you could think about was making out. Mm. At least mm. that was me, anyway. Not me. I was very godly. I was too. You're None too of that godly going on. for that. Yeah. I mean, like I didn't do it because I was godly, <laughs> but the tension was there. Binge. Don't pretend the tension wasn't there. Well, sexuality was a little different for me. A little me. bit different right. for me. Too. There we go. <laughs> Whatever. Angie and I were on the Rule Followers Club. No. I was too. Something. I didn't mean. I... Hmm. What, what was it like growing up, though? What I know things get dark. They Ugh. do. I want to be to jump into funny. it. We have to jump into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in. Well, let me rephrase it. We no. do not have to jump into it. Right. You are in control of this conversation. Yes. Okay. I want to make that clear. Yeah, very safe. Thank you. you will talk to us about your abuse now on camera. Get closer to the mic so we can hear it. I'm kidding. Right. That was a joke. Go ahead. Um, so, yeah, I know I grew up in the church and was really like into it, like leader in the youth group. Um, mm. Everything. When I listened to the first episode of The Life After and you were like going down I knocked on people's doors, handed out tracks, and did the reality house. I was just like, check, 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 check. Mm-hmm. Like, I did mm-hmm. all of those things. Um, and I was in it. I was very, I did, I led Bible studies in school. Um, it was my whole life. I just wanted to share Jesus with everyone and and make sure everyone was saved and didn't have to go to hell when they died. That was very, very important to me. Mm-hmm. Um and so, yeah, that was what I thought God wanted me to do with the rest of my life. I was going to be a missionary. Um, and then it went badly. <laughs> um, yeah. I should say, um, to give some background, that I have, when I was a child, I have sexual abuse in my background. Um mm. My father was in the military, and so we moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. And pretty much every time we moved, somebody new would find me. Mm. Um, And so it was a lot. I went through some dark things as a child. Mm -hmm. And now that I think about my um, faith, you were just talking about how you were horny at the... I really think that one thing that purity culture um, allowed for me, like they said you're supposed to turn off your sexuality. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, (laughs) sure. Um, Mm -hmm. And that actually, so I think I really followed all the rules that they told me to do. And I think in terms of my sexual abuse as a child, the, um, Mm -hmm. a lot of it, I I think that I, I sort of benefited from that part of purity culture. Mm. 
And I think that it was easier for me to turn off my sexuality than it was for people that didn't have sexual trauma in their past. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I would imagine. It was like a shadow to hide Yeah, it was, yeah, like I, (laughs) what I'm finding about the way that I deal with trauma, the way that my brain deals with trauma is um, we like to avoid all the things. Mm -hmm. And so having so much sexual trauma in my past, um, they told me I needed to, to turn off my sexuality and my brain was like, Okay, done. It was more of an invitation. <laughs> right. yeah. Like a positive invitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, that's where all the scary shit is. Mm-hmm. So let's... No, yeah. that's great. So that is going to be significant for my story. So, yeah, so you felt like you just... Like the, like the impulses weren't there. Mm-hmm. The, yeah. The need wasn't... Like the desire wasn't there. It's was just... Uh, no, and, and I I just thought that, you know, I was I was doing what, what they said um, I should do. And I didn't connect it at all to my um, sexual trauma because... You don't process any trauma um, when you're in religion. You just try to throw the Jesus Band-Aid on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I had sexual trauma in my past and was a very devoted Christian um, and was going to be a missionary. So that's to, to catch us up to where, where things started going badly. Sure. Um, I There was a mission organization that was introduced to my church when I was 15 and I went overseas with them for two months when I was 16. And then I went the following summer for five weeks. And it was that summer that I decided that I would join them. Um, well, I'm sorry. I felt that God was calling me <laughs> to join them mm-hmm. um, full time on their staff as an intern when I graduated from high school. So I decided to do that. I didn't take the college scholarships <laughs> that I had offered to mm-hmm. me. Um, I decided that I should follow God's path and I was going to be a missionary. So I moved um, to a different state when I was 18 years old and wow. um, yeah, started the internship program. Oh, this, so you were 18. Mm-hmm, brand wow. new baby adult. Didn't yeah. know anything. And okay, so I was 18, but I like grew up in fundamentalist Christianity. So like, mm. what am I, 14 really? Mm-hmm. I, <laughs> I have not been making decisions for myself. Like I have, uh, you know, they don't tell you what the world is like. Mm-hmm. Um, at all and anyway i just i had been told what to do i had been following along and um anyway it was the culture of um authority the umbrella of protection um was was always talked about um and how Mm. i the umbrella of protection yes so if i was under about that one (laughs) when i was you know uh, in my dad's house, he was my authority. Um, my parents were my authority. And then, you know, when I went to my internship, the tr- they like transferred authority to the leaders of this internship. Um, <laughs> his name is Chuck for this story. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, we... <laughs> So I'm the bad guy in this story, just so everybody knows. Yeah. yeah. This is the name. So just to, to clarify that, like, this is the name that Angie chose for the person because she doesn't want to use the real name. Yes. Before she and met it just Archer. happened. Yeah, it just happened to be my name. This was before, Yeah, this was a while ago. So The names have been changed to so, protect the guilty. Right, right, right. For sure. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, my, I was, the authority was transferred to um, this man named Chuck. He was the... Um, president of the mission organization and he was a very good friend of my youth pastor that's how he got brought into the church God, um, this whole transfer of authority bullshit for women is such fucking bullshit yeah yeah well i mean yeah is this the authority in general like authority normal problematic transfer yeah. of authority more problematic <laughs> like, like no say in the matter at all and it just makes it makes women sound like fucking like slaves or something you know that yeah. they always oh, have, to have sure. somebody in charge yeah. of rest and obey. somebody i saw a thing the other day that was like Ugh. talking about the f- uh, fourth commandment fifth commandment do not covet thy neighbor's wife which is like so you think about like that is really don't covet up. your neighbor's television you know it's just like clear like from the very beginning it's like just so you know women are objects so don't try to like steal mm, one from your neighbor. Good point. Yeah. Anyway, can you imagine stealing one and, and then like you have to just keep her hidden <laughs> anytime she goes outside? <laughs> I'm sure it happens. Like, hey, wait, carry a bunch of boxes if you're going to go outside. <laughs> one woman. 
sorry, Angie, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think authorities were uh, a big deal in my life too, I think with military background. So oh, yeah. um, I sort of feel, I look back on this now as I was like being led to the slaughter my whole life. Um, sort of, mm. I think that that happens a lot in our past culture that that you victims are groomed they are Mm -hmm. um you know the i happen to to come into a path of a monster and i had no defenses i had no um training to Mm -hmm. to deal with that um and so the horror actually started pretty quickly i was there in the first week and we were doing get to know you interviews um with the staff and one of the people on staff we're going to call her Gemma. And I also changed her name because she is also guilty. Um, and I was doing an interview with her and she brought up that she had sexual abuse in her past as a child and was telling her testimony and, you know, how God had, had changed her life. And, um, her bringing that up, um, I've wanted, I, it was, I confided in her that I also had sexual abuse in in my past. Mm. And immediately she stops and she says, how have you dealt with this? And I was brand new baby adult, right? And I hadn't, I I didn't know what she was talking about. I like, Mm. these things happen to you and then you move on with life and you keep worshiping God. I didn't deal with it. No one had ever, um, I had never dealt with it. And so I I said to her, um, I just, I didn't deal with it. I just, just moved on. She let me know that, Um, if I did not deal with it, uh, that it was going to impact every area of my life Mm. and that I had to, uh, you know, deal with this abuse if I wanted God to be able to use me. Um, and I thought, what? Yeah. (laughs) Um, now I look back on it. That's great advice. Actually, if if someone has some trauma in their past, it's really a good idea that they should, they should deal with this. Right. Um, but so she told me that I had 24 hours to make a decision on whether or not I was, um, ready to deal with this or not. What? Oh my God. And then I needed to pray about it. Oh God. Um, she said that she felt like this was the reason that God had brought me there. It can literally take people years to decide (laughs) if they want to, like when to confront that kind of thing. On top of that, I think that the spiritual abuse began though when she's like well god can't use you unless you do this Mm -hmm. right 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 that's not her authority to say and to add that on top of what you're saying of like that extra pressure that's just absolute fucking bullshit wow yeah i mean i like i would i would jump in and say like i was saying that trauma dictates like the human story like somebody in that community or her personally probably had some kind of traumatic experience with somebody that was abused as a child so now their traumatic experience to the other person's traumatic experience is to say you have to deal with this right now Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like that sounds like a trauma response to me you know Mm. it just makes me wonder anyway well yeah this will this will get cleared up in a little bit sure um so i prayed about it and cried about it because i was terrified and um went back to her the next day and she asked for my answer and i let her know that i was not ready and that i was was not going to be able to Mm. to do what she needed me to do and she stood up from her desk um like instant it was so fast and she said you are in rebellion to god and she marked me marched me into chuck's office and told him that i had sexual abuse in my background. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, I hadn't told people this yeah, before, of so. and he was <laughs> this man. Um, I was, I I met him when I was fifteen. Um, I was just in awe of him. I thought he was like this man of God, and and you know, I wanted to be a good intern. I wanted, like, I was really. Um, I can't think of the word. I I, I don't I want to say I don't want to say idolized him because then Christians are going to be like, well, you made him an idol and that was your first mistake. <laughs> um, but I really like I looked up to him. He was my mentor. And all of a sudden, this man and it was a man. He had a penis, um, which is a big distinction when you're when you grow up in purity culture. Like you don't talk about sexual things in mixed company. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Um, and all of a sudden she 
just told him like my wow. deepest, darkest wow. <laughs> secret. Wow. Um, it felt terrible. You have so much shame when you have sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, when you add purity culture on top of that, mm-hmm. when yeah. what they value in women is purity above all else. And mm-hmm. like literally that was taken from me at age two. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so I, you know, I just, I always felt like I was, so I just had tons of shame. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, yeah, well, let's, I mean, you, that's another thing that we haven't even touched. I don't think on this show is the fact that like people that are raped or sexually assaulted or sexually abused are assume it's never addressed in purity culture. It's never like, Oh, let's talk about like, this happens to so many people. Let's talk about it as a separate thing than the, like, st- like choose to stay pure, you know? So like everybody I knew that was a, a, a victim of some kind of assault growing up felt intense shame about it. I mean, I remember in high school, one of my friends confided in me that she was effectively date raped. She was mm-hmm. like, got drunk and was raped. And she was like, like her, one of the first things that came out of her mouth is I guess this means I'm not a virgin anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. You right. know, and that's like the, that's what that culture does to those people. Yep. It's like the amount of shame that you experience as someone who, like for me, someone who is, who is not sexually abused or, or assaulted at any point in my life felt intense amounts of shame that I still deal with the, to the, this day, much less like having it taken from you and still being told like, well, there's something wrong with you. Mm-hmm. You know, that's incredibly toxic. Yeah. And not at all that my experiences, I, I, you know, I, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to compare one up or anything. This is just like comparing another... trauma is a totally useless. Endeavor, right. 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 So I guess what I'm saying is like, here's another flavor of sure. purity culture, you know, for, for me of realizing that I was gay, didn't act on it, but still had that like shame that was walking around with me. And it had to do with something that who I was not something that I did, Right. you know, and the same with you, you didn't do anything. It was something that was done to you. And for her to, number one, put you in the hot seat and make you responsible for something that you should not have been responsible for. And then number two, for her to not respect that and then to break these boundaries, like, and fuck, like, you moved. Like, yeah. you you were away from your family right. for the first time, I'm assuming, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. um, that was your entire world. That was your only existence and where you were existing and or where you were living. That's everything. Yeah. And they, they isolate you in the internship program. Like, you know, they, it's, it's crazy stuff, but they want you to, of course, to be super focused on God. And so they, there's not extra time for a whole lot of stuff. You have to, to join a church. There was an outlet there, but, but no, it was very like, they were my whole world. And, um, yeah, it was, what did he do next? What did he say next? So, um, from there, they took turns um, going back and forth, telling me that um, God had spoken to them and that this is is what he had, dis- like this was his plan for me, that um, I was supposed to obey them. Um, if I didn't obey them, that I would be in rebellion to God. Um, I wouldn't be protected by God because, you know, if you, if you don't obey your authorities, then God won't protect you. <clears throat> and so um, they're... They needed me to tell them everything that happened to me. And I had um, five abusers by the time I was age 12. And they needed me to tell them all of the details. That was was what they needed me to do to deal with my abuse meant that I had to tell them. How did you know them at this point? Well, I had been in the internship for like a week. um, Mm. But I had been... But you knew him for like 15. I had... I had no, I had, I had gone when I was 15 for two months with a team. He was there for like, for a part of it, but he wasn't even there for the but whole two months. Even, oh my God. It wasn't. Yeah, no, this was um, intimate. And again, with a male in the room, like I right. hadn't, mm-hmm. and, and they told me to turn off my sexuality. Like I didn't talk about sex. I hadn't said the word penis in mixed company before. And they wanted mm-hmm. me to describe sex acts mm-hmm. um, oh in front of a man. It was, oh. So my God, yeah, fucked up when I couldn't speak the words that they needed me to say, they were taking turns screaming and yelling in my face, um, telling me that I was in rebellion. Um, there were times that I was like dry, dry heaving into a trash can. Like I, it was, 
it was terrible. This yeah. lasted for six hours. Oh um, my God. Fuck. Finally, after six hours, it was all out and I could leave. And then my abuse became sort of like a background theme of the internship. Um, they had other things that like I had to write down every detail after that. Um, and they had meetings that it was just my abuse was a, was a theme. And, mm. um, I was trying to do what they wanted, what they needed. I was trying to, I believed them. I believed them that if, mm. if I didn't do, um, what they said that, that I would be in rebellion, that God wouldn't protect me. Um, it's like one of my biggest issues with this is it, it wasn't, they weren't interested in helping you. That wasn't the tone. It wasn't like, we want to help you work through this. It was like, if you don't do this, you're rebelling against God. So it's just a negative. There's no, it's, oh God, that's and so they knew, exhausting. Like, they I knew how, like, cause that is all I wanted. Like I wanted to please God. I wanted to right. live my life for God. Like they, it was just exactly what they needed me to say to comply like oh oh god is is gonna mm. this is this is what god wants me to do um what did they think was gonna happen i guess like i'm you know like i hear what you're saying chuck but like there's still this weird part of me that's like okay brady try to put yourself in their shoes to try to figure out like within their belief system what they're trying mm -hmm, to accomplish mm -hmm. but like you know it, it got to the point with like even with abuse that i've seen happen uh you look at it you know i just still scratch my head of like how could you have been so cruel like what a, yeah what is the method to this fucking madness yeah. and i i just don't understand how i i cannot wrap my mind around shaming somebody for having something like that done to them i my humanity just keeps me from being able to comprehend that i guess i don't know I don't get, I mean, I, I think it comes from, I think it stems from like having really backward definitions for love, mm. right? Mm. Like just having like this idea that like, it's the love is a verb thing, which like, you know, like that, like, at, like love is like, is like doing what needs to be done for somebody, right. whether regardless of like how they feel about it or how you feel about it okay, okay, or yeah. what the, you know, what, how they're reacting to it or any of that. It's just... This is the loving thing to do, so I'm gonna. We're gonna push through it, you know. I never heard like love is a verb explained that way. Um, I just knew it as the DC talk. I <laughs> right. see what you're saying now. Yeah. Yeah, it's the it's the acts of yeah, it's you know, Ew. it's that yeah, it's that it's that idea that like the loving thing to do is often the mean thing. You know, that my church really, um, that, that like even hateful thing, my Calvinistic, you know? believe it or not, my Calvinistic church was really into that. Really? Yeah. Weird. The, wait, the guy that like, uh, that like slaughtered heretics was like, <laughs> I, I, anyway, I went to that church too. Yeah. <laughs> made it out by the skin of my teeth. Yeah. Um, let's take a short break. Yeah. When we get back, we're going to hear the rest of Angie's story and then we're going to get into the, uh, we're going to get into some, some more positive material. Hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon, it's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> and we're back. I'm talking about uh, some pretty heavy shit here. Uh, got Angie, got Brady in the studio. Um, Angie, what happens next? So, um, the internship program, the way that it worked is that the, um, organization takes teens overseas, um, to do mission work, to do mission work during the summers. So as an intern, I would be in the office for nine months and then I would go with the team, um, overseas for the mission trip. So I made it to the very end of the office part of the internship. Um, and it was 
the last day before we were leaving to start the summer and they called me in for uh, another meeting and pretty quickly the topic turned to my views as it often did and then um what seemed like even more quickly um the topic changed completely and I realized that I was sitting in the middle of my own exorcism. Oh my God. Oh my God. They let me know that um, when I was sexually abused as a child, that I had been possessed by a demon and that if they um, didn't cast the demon out, that my future children would be sexually abused. Like, where's that in the Bible? I know, right? (laughs) I mean, like... I know every church has like their weird shit, right? But like that, like that's wh- bonkers. Like where, yeah. like why? Why? Yeah. Wh- so this is actually um, my ticket out because, like you said, where is that in the Bible? The um, yeah. organization was actually under the Southern Baptist um, Southern Baptist Convention. They were accredited by them, and I knew in Southern Baptist doctrine that like the darkness cannot go where the light is. And since Jesus was inside of me, that I could not be possessed by a demon and Mm -hmm. that they were going against the Bible, um, by doing this exorcism. And so, um, Oh, I didn't, (laughs) I still had to get through it. Mm. Um, and it was, I don't even know. It is a mind fuck. You guys, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. they um because i couldn't even i couldn't believe what was coming out of their mouth like a, mm. to to have someone say that you know you're possessed by a demon is shocking and then at one point Gemma said demon look at me and i've never looked at something so fast i like my eyes shot to her and i remember thinking for a split second like did a demon just do that but mm. i just i was mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. shock that that came out of her mouth right yeah um and then as we were going through, I, uh, the exorcism, this is part of my trauma. It, I, it comes in bits and pieces. Um, I don't have, like, I don't, I remember there was something that I needed to say. They needed me to say, and I couldn't say it. And so I think it might have been like, maybe they needed me to talk more about the details. I don't, I'm not sure, but I couldn't speak whatever it was. Um, that actually, it's a huge part of my my trauma now, what you talked about, um, in just being in, in safe environments and then your body having that. Um, mm-hmm. so response. when I get into, um, rooms with people in authority, like doctors, uh, I freeze, I can't speak, I can't find my words. Um, so that was in, when I was there, I couldn't speak whatever it was that they needed me to say. Um, one of them said, demon, loose her tongue. And I remember sitting there thinking like, if I speak, they're going to think a demon is right. is speaking for me. Right. Like, I didn't know how to make it end. Like, I, I don't know how it ended. I don't, I don't know how it ended. Um, but when, you know, they did the whole like bop you on the forehead thing that you see, yeah. like, televangelists Good do were, you, were they like i mean were they like have, they have a like hands on you i was or sitting they really in a chair proximity? they were they were inches um at, at points they were inches from my face oh screaming my um at one point they were holding my arms down so that i couldn't cover my face when i was crying oh my god um god. so yeah it was horrific um that's so fucked up i'm do you wonder why would they have waited that long to want to do that if they felt like there was a demon in you that's so fucked up? I don't know. I, so here's the when um, Gemma told me her testimony about how she um, had sexual abuse in her past. She had, uh, according to her, she had actual repressed memories, and she was an intern at this mission organization when these memories came back to her. And so she um, she was staying the the head of the mission organization um, actually wasn't involved in this demon stuff at all. She was staying with um, a pastor in a, a church who wasn't Southern Baptist Church. Um, and so as sh- her trauma came to the surface, they brought Chuck um, into the church to help because he was she was 
his intern. And so he had to sort of be a part of that. And um, these are, there's a name for, for this. This is called the deliverance ministries. Um, uh, this is these like casting out of demons mm -hmm. for things um, happens in deliverance ministries. I didn't know that these things existed when I was mm -hmm. going through it, but mm -hmm. um, so I think that her pastor was um, involved in deliverance ministries and that's what brought it into this mission organization. Um, I think the fact that I came shortly after like everything had happened with her. So what they put her through, um, she was 23 when, when this was all, when she was taking part in this happening to me and she's 23, she was 23 and she's, and you're 18. Mm -hmm. And not only is she put as like Wait. a, like authority over you and oh, Wayne, yeah. but like, like in this really intense way to open right. up about sexual abuse yeah. to somebody who's like old enough to be just your junior camp counselor. Yeah. 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 I mean like to me in my mind, 18 to 23 is the same age. Like yeah. you're basically at the same maturity level. Through I, that whole. Yeah. And I see that now, yeah. but back then, like oh, she yeah. was like, she seemed older yeah, and so wiser. wise. Yeah. And I just, you know, to be like her and so yeah. she, you know, it's kind of like she, with Kristen in season one where she talked oh, about yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, when she was kind of given like an accountability partner or somebody who was kind of like in charge of it was like mm -hmm. an RA almost right you know but like RA that had you, you don't ever get away from it in like all aspects of your life yeah. including like your thought life and stuff like that um and she hers was, like was just a little bit older than two her years well. older than her or something yeah yeah and I was so I was totally right she did have trauma yeah 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 that totally um and and it also like i mean like there cool. is a there's like an issue with people that are still dealing with their own trauma dealing with other people's trauma is a uh, big thing that's a problem you know yeah problematic yeah blinds leading the blind right right so no so, offense to anybody out there whose trauma actually of course not no 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 I, de I definitely don't mean that people that are traumatized can't help people that are also traumatized it just you have to deal with it properly and you can't still be in the middle of. Oh, I was apologizing for my distasteful blinds joke. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> also that. <laughs> so she had, she had gone through, um, mm. some pretty, actually what, what they made her go through was, it was terrible. Um, so um, they actually flew, her abuser was a family member and they actually like flew this family member in and surprised what? her with it. Like oh, she had these memories God. and she confided that this had happened to her. And so the way that they decided God needed her to deal with it was to confront her abuser. Holy and, like, shit, that just, is so incredibly wrong. Yeah. So when she was, when I was struggling with what I, what they were doing to what I was going through. She even said to me at one point, she was she, at one point, she said, you think this is hard? What God made me go through. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, um, she, okay. at one, she said when they surprised her with this person that she like said to God right then and there, like, no, I'm done. And she was going to go walk in front of a car. And she said that God spoke to her and said, you can go ahead and do that. And then I will make sure that you end up paralyzed and you're going to still have to do this. You're just going to have to do it and never walk again. And this is the story that she's telling you yes. to convince you to. Yes. No. Like you have to do this. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I think, I don't know with the demon stuff because it was, it came out of nowhere. It wasn't a, like a theme throughout the year. Demons, I mean, they talked about spiritual warfare and like all of that stuff that you do when you're, you know, like, but it wasn't, it, it was out of, it felt so out of left field to have someone be casting a demon out of you. Um, so Did they encourage you to like open up about your thought life? Like, was this kind of like a thing where they were trying to like, oh, well, you, you're you struggling with this, so maybe it has to do with this. Or is it, was it, they're trying to like, do you get what I'm saying? Like yeah. a lot of times they'll kind of get a lot of information about accountability. Like if you become an accountability partner, partner with somebody, you're basically kind of giving them all of your dirty laundry. And if they have in the back of your mind, oh, you've been abused or whatever, then they'll always try to kind of like make a connection between your current struggle and the abuse. Do you think that that's where maybe they were trying to like wedge some of this stuff together or? 
they never i don't remember mm. any sort of those connections at all mm. but i i could there are gaps to all of this no, stuff so i'm not i don't i don't even know how much it's not like you started suddenly waking up and speaking backwards in your sleep or something and they're like oh, oh this do has you to mean be a or oh do you mean like did i do something to make them think that there's a demon <laughs> right right no i so no that is actually one of the one of the points i think one of the as i am going public with my story um i remember one of the points of shame that i had like throughout the years as i've you know had this in my past and didn't talk about it ever um, was thinking that like, if people hear that someone tried to perform an exorcism on me, that like all people have, they, they see horror movies and you think that someone's like contorting their body, you know, like you think right. that there's something, there was none of that. Right. And it, I mean, obviously there was none of that cause there was not a dead in my right. body, but there wasn't like, I, I, I don't, I can't connect it felt like the most random thing there it, there was no build up to it um it was just a we ha this happened to you when you were a child and the demon came in and now we have to jesus cast wow. the demon out or you were and and then at the end when it was all over and i was leaving there they said they they used the um reference of the um they said something about if you rebel against us, um, that the demon would come back. Um, the, the legion, a legion of demons would come back. They use that Bible story oh my God. Okay, cool. about how like you <laughs> cast out the demon and don't feel. That's anyway, great. so like, Hey, we, we heard this, we heard this rad story once about these, this demon legion. They're like a gang, man. Yeah. I don't know. It just seems, it's so silly to me. Like, I, I'm not trying to be insensitive to your story, but when you, you said that they made a reference, I was going to be really pissed if they would have ruined the really good line from Poltergeist that like, this house is clean. Yeah. Like, <laughs> right, oh. right, right, right. Yeah, but I'm glad they just ruined a Bible verse. I don't need right, that. Right. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> no. So, um, so yeah, I, that happened. And I'm so uh, sorry. But like I said, that was my ticket out. I um yeah. I knew that they had broken some some big rules. Um, trying to say that I had a demon in me. I was a child of God. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, all right. So, <laughs> so I mean, you, you, Angie was pissed. Yes. You really relied on the theology, yes. kind of like as your yes, way out. Yeah. absolutely. And it was finally like I could tell my parents everything that had happened. So I called my mom when I got home and told her, and um she needed to get off the phone with me and ask my pastor and my dad if I could come home because of course oh my God. authority Jesus oh my god you are kidding me um just one thing after another yeah <laughs> and it was you know it was like a i had raised money to go there and and so to come home early it was there was a there, it was obviously none of that actually makes sense um but in that culture that made sense yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um and so you know she called me back and let me know that I could, I could get out of there. Um, and when Chuck found out that I had told what they had done, he went into damage control and mm. denied the exorcism. What? Yeah. Come on. Yep. Um, so he told. Oh, what, what exorcism? I know. I know, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't know Chubb. You don't, I'm sorry. You don't remember screaming <laughs> two inches from my face? Do you you forget, bopped you forgot my that forehead. <laughs> yeah, right. guy. Yeah. So obviously if the Southern Baptist convention found out that, you know, he's performing exorcisms, um, he was risking losing his accreditation. He was already, I think, under probation for some other things uh, and so um yeah his his plan was to completely deny that it happened um and they told my pastors and my parents that i was in rebellion that i was like a tool of satan trying to destroy and bring down their ministry um but yeah that i completely made the entire thing up um so uh, the abuse stops there, right? Yeah. 
uh, my church. They were so, you know, led by the Holy Spirit and <laughs> handled everything perfectly. Mm. Good. Not... Oh, well, that's good. I guess that's the end of the episode. On the next week. <laughs> um, so I mentioned that Chuck was a, a good friend of my youth pastor. That's how they got brought into my church. And um, I should also mention that my youth pastor was, uh, I didn't have a great relationship with my dad as a teenager, you know, teenage years and whatnot. Mm. And my youth pastor had kind of taken on this father role. Um, And, you know, I, he meant the world to me. I had to, you had to choose someone to write about in order to get into the internship. And I chose him and I, you know, like he meant the world to me. And so when I showed up for our meeting, um, when I came, I had a meeting set up with him after I returned to explain everything that happened. Um, Of course he spoke to Chuck first. Uh, Um, he just spoke to Chuck that the first day, obviously. But when of I showed up, did, yeah. I know. This, hey, yeah. you know what? I really need to get to the bottom of this. Let's talk to this guy I've never met before. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and, let's take his word over like who I like. Well, the no, person that's like, Chuck was his his good friend. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. So he had that. no. He had spoken. Okay. Chuck called him right away to oh. to try to um, you know say girl. yes. So. So yeah, when I showed up for my meeting with um, my youth pastor, what did we say we we're going to call him? Steven? Steve? Steve. We'll say, yeah, Steve. Steve. Fucking Steve. Fucking Steve. Um, okay. So when I showed up for that meeting, he was actually wearing a shirt um, with their logo on it. Um, Ew. No way. Yeah. And he would not hear me. He wouldn't. I tried to tell him what happened. Wait, the logo of the missions organization? Yeah. yeah. He was, he wore, he was wearing one of their shirts when we when I showed up to our planned scheduled meeting to talk about Steve's a motherfucker. <laughs> he was like, "Hey, get me that uh, that uh, shirt." Yeah, Angie's coming. Yeah. So I walked in and I like it was um, <laughs> it was horrifying. Mm. Um, it was clear walking in whose side he was on, um, and he it was at that point sides because. Chuck had said it didn't happen and I said it did happen Um, my word against theirs Um, and then of course there were two people in the room that were doing the exorcism and then one person was in the room praying um, on the other side of the room and so they had three people saying it didn't happen versus me so when I went to talk to my pastor or my youth pastor um, to start explaining to him the details he told me that I needed to focus on my own sin and not the sin of others and um, that was the end of the meeting. When I spoke with my my head pastor, he actually met with me for several hours and listened to everything. He seemed so compassionate. It was the first person that like showed like, whoa, I can't believe this happened to you. He's the, he gave me a book on deliverance ministries. He said, I think that, that they were involved in this. And I was like, I read the book and I was like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what that was. Um, and so I thought I had hope at that point that you had an it was going to, yeah. yeah. And so we mm. finished that meeting and it was never spoken of again. I was trying desperately to, to handle it in the most godly way. And so I gave the information to my authorities as I had been taught to do and um, didn't tell other people. I didn't want to yes. gossip. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, so I had raised money from people in my church. They'd mm-hmm. given money, and then everyone knew that I was home, but no one knew why. Wow. And it was terrible. And I couldn't, you know, I had I spoke to my pastors. I spoke to my Sunday school teacher. There were a couple, and my best friend's parents, and that was it. They didn't, you know, there was just, I didn't tell other people. And it was horrible having to to be there and feel like I had failed. Um, as a missionary, I had failed. Like God had called me to go there, right? Like why had He called me to go there to go through all of that? Um, and so it was. I fucking hate that because, okay, during my church abuse situation, I didn't talk about it either until mm-hmm. it was after. So when the story would get out, you have no control over it, mm. and here you are, even in in silence, because you know, you're back from this. There's this like weird expectation of like, well, what's wrong? Why did you come back? Ah. And your response can't be what I mean, it should be able to be, but it wasn't able to be at that time. 
Yeah, because the motherfuckers tried to exercise a demon out of me. You know, like, gossip. Yep. But it's not gossiping. But that's that's what you're. Yeah. Led to believe. Yep. I couldn't talk. I couldn't speak ill of them. Like I couldn't speak badly about them. Um, you know, you have to focus on the good. It was. Well, what's weird to me is that the worst part of that story is not the exorcism. It's everything before that, like leading up to it, like them forcing her to talk about her experiences being sexually abused as a child is definitely the worst part of that. Mm -hmm. But if she had gone to the Southern Baptist Convention with that, nobody would have given a fuck. Right. Even though it's incredibly misguided. That's the, the part that kills me now that I think of how I, (laughs) I didn't know that everything they had done up and up to the exorcism was wrong. Right. I had no idea. And, and finally they do the exorcism and I was like, Oh, I can, I can get out. And I, I had no, I was so naive and you still had to fucking wait until they used to like use their theology against them. Yeah. Yep. I couldn't get out until that's that closed system. I mean, it's a big cult, man. Like yes. the rules are different. The rules are different than the rest of the world. And that's fucked up. Like that's, so yeah, it fucked me up and I started losing my mind. And uh Yeah. What do you mean by that when you say you started losing your mind? So I had PTSD. Um You did? Yes. From what? <laughs> from the trauma. And um but I didn't know that I had PTSD. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about mental illness. Um, because I grew up in a cult and they, they don't talk about those things. Mm-hmm. Um so I couldn't I started to have full body reactions when I was in churches, when I was in my church, um, I, everything was triggering. Everything brought me back there. Um, I had panic that was controlling my life. Like drop you in the middle of the floor into a ball terror. Mm. Um, that was, it would just come out of nowhere. Um, I had depression, the anxiety that was my my terror. Um, I couldn't I couldn't do things like um, my mom and I got into a huge fight one time because I hadn't unpacked the boxes and it had been so many months, but I couldn't touch them. Mm, um, mm-hmm. And it's kind of like that avoidance that yeah, you mentioned earlier. Yeah, and so that that was I had to start the first thing in in my faith that had to go was church. Um, I couldn't be in church without, like, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't walk into church. I couldn't breathe. Yeah. Um, being there. And I think a lot of that also had to do with the, the, like, no one knew what was going on. And I was just, it just had this secret, this, like these things that had happened to me that I couldn't talk about. And, um, and so I had to stop going to church and, um, I still desperately tried to cling to God. I, 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 I believed that, you know, everything happens for a reason and um you know I needed to pray more and if I I felt like I was experiencing these symptoms because I hadn't forgiven them Mm. um fast enough and I kept like begging God Mm. to help me forgive them um I remember a really internal like I I thought that the reason that I was experiencing the craziness the panic and the the depression and the um just my body like I didn't I didn't want to be in my own skin anymore I I couldn't I couldn't it was awful feeling um but I clung to God and and I don't know I don't know how many months it was that I prayed and read the Bible and prayed more and read the Bible more and prayed more and read the Bible more (laughs) Mm. desperate to Mm -hmm. get um these symptoms to go away nightmares were I couldn't, I would wake up and I couldn't, I couldn't, I knew that I was not there anymore, but my body, it felt like I was there. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and I remember begging God, just take away my nightmares. Like I just need some sleep. And, mm-hmm. and like, I understand you need me to suffer through this. I need to be tested. And mm-hmm. you know, like whatever I have to go through this for some reason, but like, please, mm-hmm. can you just take away my nightmares at least? Uh, um, yeah. What a- and he didn't. <laughs> um, yeah. Praying and reading the Bible. 
can I ask, where was your family with this? Were they supportive of you? Did they believe you? Oh, um. No, that's a. They were, they did the best that they could. Okay. Um, but I, th they had no idea, um, how to handle what I was going through. What my mom, you know, I wasn't unpacking those boxes. She saw that as laziness. And so when we, we got into a big fight about it and the words that she threw at me were, well, maybe Chuck was right because you need to learn some responsibility. And we've talked about that since then. She didn't mean like he was right to like exercise you, but they're, they're, they're very authoritative, authoritarian. Mm -hmm. She was referencing that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but, but there hit, wasn't, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. She, there was just no understanding of, of the trauma. There was no, mm -hmm. they had no idea um, mm -hmm. the damage that had been done or what she was messing with when she like threw that at me. And I remember like that felt like a dagger. Um, and in spite of how, how you felt about it, they couldn't let go of the idea that he was an authority figure, right? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm thinking of like in, in season one when we talked about counseling and one of the reasons that pastors aren't good as counselors is because the dual relationship. Right. And when you're in such an authoritative, you know, Christian community where your mom and your dad also double as, you know, agents of your pastor's belief minions. System. Yes. You know what I mean? Um, even your parents now are a dual relationship mm. and mm. it kind of compromises Ooh. that relationship. It yeah. feels like, and, and I'm, even for your mom to have come back with that sort of quippy answer yeah. feels very double agency. And that, that kind of leaves a little bit of um, unrest and yeah. uh, distrust, I would feel. Yeah. There, was, there, were, there were things that were not handled well um, that they have expressed remorse for. Good, um, good. It took them four years to leave my church um, the church continued to fund this man in the organization. My pastor was on his board of directors and he can, he stayed in that position. There was like no fallout for him, um, for what happened to me. And, um, you know, they, my youth pastor kept sending students there. Like there was, um, so after four years, um, my, oh, you'll love this story. Um, my parents, their trip that the, the youth group was going to go on fell through. And so they decided that they would plug in with this organization. And when my parents found that out, they were like, no, done. Um, I, they, first, they went to the business meeting and tried to say, you shouldn't do this. Um, and then when they said that they were going to leave the church over it, the, the, my pastor, they went to my pastor to talk to him. And explain, like, why are you still working with this organization? And he goes, well, let me assure you, I don't plan on sending my children. Fine for the other, mm. the other kids. The, the, the mm. families that didn't know what wow. this man had done. Wow. He was fine sending the youth group so there. That's cr so it's like he... <sighs> what the so fuck? So it's like he, the cognitive distance there is amazing because he actually believed you. This is the man that like gave me the book on deliverance ministries. Like I thought he believed me in that meeting and then he did nothing. And so, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Cause now I think on it and I'm like, how did you hear those details and do nothing if you believed me? Like, yeah, I don't understand. That's so I don't know. I haven't crazy. talked to him about it. <laughs> yeah. He's a good shepherd. That one. Um, I don't well, know where I was. Let's, it's a uh, good <laughs> shepherd I do not want. <laughs> He's still what? the pastor there. God damn it. Let's, let's take a break. And um, ideally, let's talk about something a little bit happier than this ridiculous story that we just had to... Angie had to live through. We just had to listen to it for, you know, 45 minutes. So uh, when we get back... The Life After Facebook page is a great way to get in touch with other religion survivors. Also, we like to post interesting articles on there. And it's a good way to get a hold of us. And you won't need a concordance to find us. <laughs> we... <laughs> we have a link to the Facebook page on our website, thelifeafter.org. 
or search The Life After on Facebook. Finally, you could just go to our URL, facebook.com slash thelifeafterorg. And we're back. Um, Angie, so I, I mean... We, Chuck looks- just farted, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> You uh, got found out. <laughs> he said that and then hit record. I always like, uh, no. so when the, um, the, I want to say it was Sims 2, when one of them farted, they would go, uh, chop it, chop it. <laughs> so like me and my friends in high school would just say that anytime we, we farted. Like that's how you announce chop it, chop it. I loved the Sims. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, Angie, you, you eventually, eventually you made it out of the system, eventually started getting real help, but the, the road there was less than ideal. Yeah. 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 Um, so I used to think of this, um, time of my life as like, I was in rebellion to God. Like I finally Mm. was just like, why won't you take the nightmares away? Mm -hmm. And, um, and you felt that you were doing something wrong and that's why that was. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I was just, yep. Um, and so I started to um, do what a lot of trauma survivors do, and I started to self-medicate. Um, anything I could do to not feel what I was feeling. Mm-hmm. And eventually that spiraled down to um, really self-destructive behaviors. Um, so was this like your uh, substance abuse, I'm assuming, was your, yeah substance abuse chuck wins details <laughs> no, yeah, yeah you need to the, tell me there, <laughs> about every substance abuse experience <laughs> yeah. every detail yeah um no there's the the substance abuse is not anything too exciting um the you know regular alcohol abuse um and so I, you're really rebelling it you're like well if i'm rebelling i might as well be rebelling so baptist yeah, yeah. That's like- <laughs> do, you wanna, do you want to know where it started excedrin migraine <laughs> oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Take yeah. extra excedrin migraine yeah, and it sure. has caffeine i don't know what mm-hmm. it was but there was something in it that made me feel different now i know that it made me feel not ptsd you I know mean, like it was practically molly for a baptist <laughs> it was that's, that's where it started <laughs> anyway <laughs> i hate you that was so good i don't know what molly is molly is like a really strong drug oh it's a, well yeah. not like a super strong drug but just it was yeah that was a really funny comparison sorry um so yeah i i did a lot of i was cutting um eventually mm. at one point there was a lot of like die to self in the mm, um yeah. They just preached that all the time. And so I have dye carved into my stomach. Um, mm, mm. Like just some pretty, I was just going through some yeah, terrible, yeah, yeah. terrible stuff. Eventually um, I tried to die. Yeah. And um, I ended up in the ICU for several days and um, they don't let you just go home after you try to kill yourself. Yeah. And so I was admitted to a psychiatric hospital. Mm-hmm. And I spent several weeks there and that was the beginning Um, because where you should go to deal with trauma is licensed professionals, people Mm -hmm. (laughs) like some people that have accountability, um, you know, practices that that have been studied anyway. So I was finally in that environment. I finally had. the diagnosis PTSD, which started to give me some understanding for what was happening in my body. Um, and it was the beginning of healing. Um, I remember sitting in the room with, and, and telling these licensed professionals (laughs) what had happened to me and their faces were just, they finally validated like, the horror on their faces matched the horror in my soul. Like it was just yes. like these people were like, what happened to you was terrible. And it makes so much sense that you lost your mind. Yeah. Um, and oh, that's so, such a, that's, that had to be such a good yeah. feeling to be affirmed. Yeah. I mean, it's confusing too, right? Because you, this is also like what you've based your life around. And this is like, True. they're telling you like your your belief system was fucked up yeah. right so it's yeah, confusing it but it's also 
I'm sure the affirmation is much more relieving yep. than the confusion is yep. negative, right? That was the beginning. Um, when you have options other than pray and read the Bible, and you begin to see that these um, things are helping you, and, and people would say, like, well, God used, um, you know, psychology God, to right. help you. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, oh, God, yeah, like, that, give nothing. Him credit for everything, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. But also for nothing. Right. You start talking about bad things, right? Right. When I was like crying out for him, there was, anyway, so the, I finally had coping skills that were, you know, helping me um, heal from the trauma. And it, it's been a, it's been a process. Trauma doesn't, you know, it's not this like, you know, you're, you're healed. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously I have a, shit ton of trauma in my life so there are still things from my past that i haven't processed i just began a new therapy this year um emdr mm -hmm. which yeah. is um eye movement desensitization. desensitization something um right <laughs> eye movement desensitization desensitization and reprocessing and reprocessing yes, <clears throat> yes. um so when you were talking about desensitization earlier it was uh this has been hugely helpful for me emdr therapy is different from talk therapy and if you can imagine um how difficult it is for me to talk about mm. my trauma mm -hmm. um because i was forced to like oh they, yeah that's part of your trauma yeah talking about your trauma is yeah. part of your trauma yep. wow yep yeah um so you know like i they they just opened up my childhood trauma like kids Christmas morning they were just like Wah. so now I have yeah. a therapy um where I don't have to do as much talking and I can I can do reprocessing and and it's been um just super helpful for yeah. me I don't can you help me understand a little bit about the eye movement part of that so it uh yeah so it imitates um dreaming basically so you the have REM yeah, the idea is to like, like they'll use something or just their hand to move it back and forth, so your eyes are going back and forth. So it fe it effectively like feels. It allows your brain to process what's happening without like having to, like the the eye movement makes you feel like you're dreaming, so you're not indul you're not getting into the moment. You're just like processing the memories. Is that pretty accurate? Um, I what I know about it is the you have to to stimulate both sides of your brain, you have to do bilateral stimulation. Oh, okay. I think that's part of it too, okay. with your eyes moving back and forth. Um, okay. And it helps the memories transfer from your amygdala, where they are in your trauma, right. to your hippocampus, what you were talking about. So, um, but yeah, I've also heard about the, the rapid eye movement when you're in REM sleep, and yeah. I don't really remember how that connects right now. Mm-hmm. But that's, yeah, that's when you're... I just remember we'll, bilateral we'll, stimulation. Us non-psychologists yeah. will put the pieces together here. On <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's the same So as, helpful. Uh, it's, just hypnotiz it's just hypnotizing you, right? You're just no. moving your eyes back. <laughs> like, this is me trying to... <laughs> right. Yeah, my own shit. No, that makes sense, though. Right. Yeah, no, you're... Yeah. It is... I When I think of, about it, it is... Um, you basically are inviting your PTSD symptoms to come and sit next to you and maybe like even hug them for a little bit. And so it's, it, it can feel intense. It, it took several months for me to be ready because you have to be able to like go into these memories and, and, you know, be able to sit with these symptoms and desensitize yourself to them. Um, and it took me a long time to kind of feel ready. Uh, any, any time that I've heard any when say anything negative about EMDR, they've felt like it was too intense and it was too much. And, and I can totally see how that's possible if you are not, if you haven't done the work to make sure that you are able to handle hugging your PTSD symptoms, then um, it's, I mean, it, that's intense. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's, um, I recommend it, but, but be prepared to, it's hard work <laughs> yeah that's um, i mean it all you're you're opening pandora's box yeah. by doing that you got to deal with whatever comes out so okay so you're working through your stuff still to this day yeah still working through things because dealing with trauma takes a lot of time unfortunately yeah. for all of us uh tell me about how your um 
you, your your ability, your invitation, sort of by this suicide attempt to 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 space yourself, create space, and 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 get away from your fundamentalist Christian beliefs, right? What about what about that? What about that process? What have you learned that has that has helped you overcome that experience and that's helped you grow? One of the worst parts about the belief system that I had when I was in my cult was um, the total depravity that we are just the worst. Right. Um, right. And you have to, you know, in order for, for God to, to even look at you, like, anyway, it's, so we are pretty terrible. Yeah. And there is no hope for any good things um, in us that is all through God. And so you have to die to yourself. Yes, die to yourself. That I was supposed to um, die to myself. They told me that I was horrible because I was human. And what psychology did for me is that it it gave me answers um, mm. to explain why I am the way that I am, mm. why we all are the way that we are, why, right. you know, they're. Um, Negative bias is a real thing. I remember the verses in the Bible that talk about how you're supposed to, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is, think on these things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you, I have trauma in my past. And so when I think about my childhood, I remember these traumatic things. And I remember feeling like a horrible human because I couldn't think about positive things. (laughs) Um, and so finding out about negative bias and, and how our brains, um, have been wired to protect us from the negative things. Like we have to remember where the, where the poisonous berries are. Mm -hmm. Um, and so your Mm -hmm. brain just holds on to the negative more Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than the positive to, to protect you, um, from things. It's, it it was an answer. I'm not this terrible person who can't stay positive. I am a human being who is like struggling to survive this horror um and so there was just answers that started to give me like i'm not i'm not terrible i'm just human that's huge i'm just human that's huge and finally being outside of the church i could start looking at humanity like it it's really cool (laughs) like we're really cool beings um we're not depraved like the the things i think about one of the questions on your um was was like what good do you hold from the church and it's the humans (laughs) and also the worst part of church for me was the humans (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and I just think about humanity now so differently. Like there's not this, this, um, this God who is being so mean. And like, I remember why, why God, aren't you telling my pastors that this happened to me? Like, why aren't you yes. telling them yeah. to believe me? Like yeah, speak. Yeah. To them, Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really relate with what you just said about um, wondering why God wouldn't say something to them, mm-hmm. right? Because we always hear stories about, you know, single moms who can't pay their bills and then they pray and God sends that yeah. the money to them and all these really encouraging stories that I'm glad happen. But the same thing happened to me where I was being abused by different levels and different, even the people that I would go to and ask for help within the church also kind of turned against me. And so Mm -hmm. that really bothered me of, I understand living in a dangerous world where bad things are going to happen. But when it's people of God doing it to you and then he's not intervening and seems cool with his children, you know, systematically taking turns, taking the shit on you. um, That kind of makes you question your faith a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming. A little bit. I remember feeling like Job and Job messed me up, but I remember feeling like he, you know, like I can endure any, anything because that's what, you know, true Christian, like can, can withstand any test from God. Um, and I remember feeling like, 
you know, Job was abandoned by everyone too. <laughs> um, I do, I remember my point about the, the, the good thing, the good that is in church is the humans. Um, how I, that feels so different to me now because I used to think like humans were the scary thing. Like we had to be so afraid of humans because we were, we're all evil and like our base, like the root of us is evil. And I don't feel that way at all. I feel mm. like we have so much um, hope in humanity and that like, if we could all get some trauma therapy, we would all right. <laughs> benefit. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, but I just, I, I do feel like if we could, as a society, learn how to embrace our humanity, learn about psychology, the things that make us, um, how, what makes us tick, like, especially I think because I'm female, that there's a lot of learned helplessness in Christianity that mm. like God will, mm. will take care of it. And, and, and now I think about how, um, so my youngest son has autism and how he was diagnosed with autism a year ago and his one year anniversary, um, of his diagnosis was this past week. And, um, the as the anniversary was approaching i was starting to to kind of struggle with like remembering the day of his diagnosis and and how hard it was like i cried it was terrifying it was um and so as the day approached i realized that i needed to be very intentional with how i handled that anniversary um and that i could absolutely take the the time and space to to grieve and mourn um for what future i thought um our family was going to have but what I really what felt so powerful to me um was I wanted to to turn change the story for my older son who's seven who saw how much I struggled in the beginning like I you know my eyes when I cry they swell it's terrible so um my son just saw a lot of sadness and and I wanted to change the story for him and so I very intentionally with my husband we we decided that we would take his diagnosis day and turn it into happy autism day in our house. Mm. And, um, we, That's as cool. a family, like we wrote down all the things that, that make being an autism family special. And like we have a therapy swing hanging from our ceiling and, yeah. um, just there's, there's some cool things that the therapists that come into our house and the people that we've met, like we've had some really great, yeah. um, things that have happened. And, to be intentional about focusing on those things as opposed to the hardships. It just feels like, yeah, this makes sense. This yes. is what we okay. like, but in embracing my humanity, like allowing for the the hard things too, I'm not, I was able to kind of do some of the grieving as I was preparing for the anniversary. I don't know. It just feels so much more powerful that I have, mm more control, um, that I understand how my brain works, that I can, I can see what I need and I can do something about it. I can, I can work with my humanity to generate the life that I want. It's it's lovely. It's <laughs> untold a depravity and coming from a Southern Baptist background as well, fundamentalism can't evolve it, it's not going to have right. any new answers that's the big yeah i and, would yeah and so yeah. we got used to just defeat being defeated mm -hmm. almost yeah and thinking the world has to get a lot better before the ends of the world so it was almost like you 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 learn to be okay not improving anything mm -hmm. right. just like yep. coming to peace with the everything shit it's going to get worse yep. yeah absolutely we're yeah not there and, anymore. It, and it, it it goes back to what you were saying about getting help at the psych ward it's like oh these people have answers mm -hmm. because yes. they've asked the questions and they've mm -hmm. done yes. the work yes and that's humanity right i mean mm -hmm. fundamentalism has nothing to offer in that way it has n it just gives you the textbook answers the mm -hmm. literal textbook answers yeah. from the old textbook that has n absolutely almost no relevance relevancy at this point right relevance <laughs> relevance i think <laughs> I think about the biggest switch in, um, and when I look around at the world, when you look around at the beauty in the world, mm. <laughs> that's humans. Like they've told me mm. my whole life that humans were terrible. Like we are awful. And, you know, look at art, 
and we educate, we take care of orphans. We like we said, there are beautiful things that happen on this planet and it's the humans that are doing it. Bears aren't doing it. Sharks don't give a fuck. Humans. (laughs) You heard it here. (laughs) Sharks don't give a fuck. Humans are trying to improve this planet. In case that wasn't already evident from Shark Week, (laughs) sharks do not give a fuck about you, about your kids. They're out there just eating shit. But not I'll giving you, a fuck. But I'll tell you what, when Southern it. Baptist watches Jaws, they they root for the shark. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. Yep. So yeah, I just it's That's great. I it's love that. cool to have this this hope in humanity as opposed to this yes. fear of humans. This yes. fear. Like, sure, there's we're capable of terrible things. I have experienced some terrible things. Yeah. But oh man, humans are doing some amazing things. I couldn't agree more. I will say that one of the most healing (laughs) things for me has been, um, well, two things actually. How did I, first of all, finding for 17 years, I had this story of what happened to me inside of, sorry, 16 years because I found you guys a year ago. Um, I didn't know that other people experienced terrible things in churches and ended up leaving the faith. Um, for 16 years mm. I was alone with mm. all of this and so a long time. when I heard this podcast um and heard like you guys I mean it that was life changing and when I was introduced to the community um it was the first time that I ever told my story to people that understood what it was like to um have to speak about sex in front of mixed company like even the small nuance things that make you know that was it was incredible to hear the feedback from that um and when as i was going as i have been in therapy dealing with these traumatic experiences there's always been times there's been times where like there's language when you're healing that you need to that you know you need to let go or move on from your past like there's language in this community i always struggled with those ideas of letting go and and moving on because for the longest time i was the only one who cared about what happened to me mm. and now that i have been able to share my story with other people and i've been able to um like receive people have shown that they care and it's been able i have been able to let go of things recently that like there have just there's been huge growth um in my in my healing just finding community and finding people that understand what i've been through and so anyway i love you guys and thank you for existing because I don't know. I wanted to really, before I left the show, just say that number one, finding community is so huge. Mm -hmm. And so I keep, you know, people on the, on the, the page that are just like, I'm, I'm new here. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you don't even know your life is going to (laughs) change. Um, (laughs) and also I wanted to encourage people that are holding on to their stories, um, that find a way to share yeah yep 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 find a way to start speaking your truth because people care Mm -hmm. and um that heals us as humans like that's what we need we need people to care and um so yeah i think that's what i wanted to say thank you angie thank you so much that was really Uh, brave for you to share that story on the air thank you um we do, yeah. All of that said, um, it, it, we do have a, a secret, a couple of a couple of secret communities, um, both on Slack and on Facebook. A uh, safe place for people to process their deconstruction, speak their truth, uh, find community, share their experiences, and and uh, it is a. We try to keep it as safe as we possibly can. We don't let anybody in that's still religious or still fundamentalist. Um, we don't um, allow any kind of um, there's there's 
li- very little room to criticize people in that space. It's just a space to 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 sort of listen and listen and share your story. And naturally. Yeah, it's what very, I love about it. It's very like, natural. Yeah, it is. It's very um, smooth and natural. When I, you know, am in charge of something, or if I feel like I have some like ownership or leadership, I obsess over it. <laughs> so I used to check it all the time to make sure, you know, well, is everybody getting over, uh, around okay? Is everybody getting along okay? Sure. And I would check it all the time, and now I'm just like, fuck this. Every time I'm reading it, everybody's like, already oh, oh my god will you marry me already there yeah, <laughs> yeah no it's it is very it happens very naturally welcome it's a very authentic <laughs> space i mean i think people are more authentic there than most of the spaces i experience in irl so mm. um and um you know you never know who you're gonna you know come across your new best friend so yeah <laughs> You guys. Awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Angie, for, thank thank you for sharing show and um, telling your story with us. Absolutely. Well, um, you know what they say. They, you know what they say. They being me and you only. <laughs> well, Angie can join us today. If you don't, if you don't, go, if to you don't church, go to church, Sunday, Sunday is just, just a, a second, second Saturday. Saturday. Hot dog. Hot dog.